All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. So yeah, as he had mentioned, uh, I'm going to be talking about co-packaged copper in this presentation, uh, similar to uh, you know, the, the driving factors that you know, motivate people to want to do co-packaged copper, or similar to co-packaged optics. So I'll go over that briefly and then talk about a uh, particular direction we see co-packaged copper moving and the benefits of going that direction. Uh, and again, this is work done by Luxshare and several of my uh, you know, co-workers are up here as well. This is actually a much broader team than this, but th these are the main contributors to it. Um, so as you guys know, for you know, co-patch copper, co-package optics, you know, it's basically a movement to move the interconnect onto the substrate so you can avoid having to go to the PCB and you can get a denser interconnect and a higher signal quality interconnect. Um, reasons why you want to do that, again, the density and signal integrity. So being able to keep you know, a high you know, uh, interconnect count uh, system in a single 1U uh, switch, um, and then the signal integrity. There's multiple, um, sorry, uh, multiple reasons, multiple aspects of improved signal integrity. Uh, if you don't have to go through the vias to get to the PCB, you're going to maintain better impedance control, uh, cleaner channel, fewer reflections. Uh, you're also going to have less crosstalk in a substrate via versus a PCB via. So again, better signal integrity there. And also, with some solutions like the one we're talking about, you'll get uh, uh, an, an even cleaner channel in terms of the crosstalk because it'll be a well-shielded, uh, coherent channel uh, throughout the entire link from the substrate all the way to your port, be it a, you know, something like an OSFP port on the front or some kind of backplane cabled connector on the back. Um, and being a cable-based interconnect here, uh, it'll uh, facilitate simplified routing, uh, so you don't have to deal with all the congestion and convoluting routing on a PCB. Um, and then there's also uh, power, power benefits to this because Having a low loss, high signal integrity interconnect channel on CPC, it'll help afford other topological solutions like CPC or C to M AEC type channels, uh, so you don't have to go necessarily full V timed optics, uh, you know, on as many interconnects or as many channels. Okay, so in terms of, you know, some of the factors or, or, or thoughts you know, in, in developing or proposing a CPC solution. Uh, three prominent factors uh, you know, uh, drive a lot of our decision making, or I, we think should drive everyone's decision making in this process. One is, if you're gonna move the interconnect onto the substrate, now this, you know, the manufacturing and assembly of that substrate is gonna get a lot more complicated and costly. So you wanna minimize that. Um, if, if you're having to solder onto the substrate, that's going to be, you know, that, that's going to encounter some resistance from your partners. It's going to be expensive. It also, you know, means you got to do it right the first time because you, you can only get a certain number of soldering reflows on the substrate until, you know, uh, you know, you got to, you know, discard it and, you know, start with a new one. So it's got to be a process that, you know, is amenable uh, to your, your manufacturing partners. Um, Two, in developing a CPC-based solution, it's got to be compact. There's already, you know, a, a, a battle for real estate in terms of, you know, the higher power, higher thermal requirements in, in next generation systems. There's not the room for like, oh, well, you know, your, your CPC-based solution also needs a lot more space. There's just, you know, you got to be very dense, very compact, because uh, th those guys need all, all the space they can get and they can afford to uh, you know, allocate us any of it. Um, it's also got to be you know, a, a robust solution with regards to problems in the field. Um, if something goes wrong in the field, you, uh, the solution can't be to you know, discard you know, the, the ASIC you know, entirely and the whole substrate. Like for instance, if, uh, you, if, if it were a soldering-based solution, that would be, you know, highly costly when there's a field problem. You need something that is serviceable in the field. Uh, so we were trying to work towards a, a more modular, uh, 
type solution where you can service it in the field without having to do anything like resoldering, because again, uh, once the, the, the dye is already on the substrate and it's been deployed, you can't resolder that in the field. Um, so those are three factors that drive a lot of our considerations in developing a CPC solution. Now this picture here, or these pictures show, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the general form of our CPC solution. It's a modular-based approach, so you can have a lot of different variants on this. Um, but it starts with, let me, sorry. Okay, so this shows the substrate here. Um, and then our CPC interconnect solution is this top block frame there. And uh, there are several modular blocks that g go on to that. Um, you know, each, each one of these blocks is, is zoomed, zoomed in down here on the lower right. Uh, it contains eight by eight, so 64 differential pairs in each block. Um, and then there's 16 of those, in this case, 16 of those around the periphery uh, of the ASIC. Um, so the, it's twin X le leading all the way up to the contact surface of this. So it's a, a, just a smooth, you know, uh, you know, coherent channel impedance wise and fully shielded all the way up to the surface here. That surface will terminate to a footprint on the substrate. Uh, and in between the, that, that mating interface uh, is uh, a small compressive elastomeric uh, to facilitate uh, you know, signal integrity at that contact and also to, uh, uh, sorry, uh, you know, ma make it more robust in terms of you know, uh, vibration contact. Um, if, if something were to, it also helps serves to protect this surface. So if it were to get scratched or something like that, you simply would replace the elastomeric inter, uh, film that's there. Uh, so it, it, it's a nice modular solution because you're basically going all the way from twin X straight to the surface of, of uh, footprint contact surface here. Um, and in this configuration here where we have 16 of these 64 diff pair blocks, so that's gonna be 1,024 diff pairs or 512 uh, lanes of traffic that this form here can accommodate. Okay, and again, as I mentioned before, this is a very modular approach. So you can uh, work it out different ways. Here's, uh, you know, before I was talking about more of a switch-based application where you're gonna have 512 lanes, here's one where you can maybe in put two instanti instantations of this down to accommodate 1,024 lanes. Um, and again, it's, it's uh, what I didn't mention before, but because of the form hat, uh, the way it's, it's just twin X all the way in through here, it's also very low height, a little bit over 19 millimeters, like I think 19 and a quarter millimeters in height. And the pitch is also very dense. It's basically, you know, nearly just the width of the, the, the twin X wire. So about 1.9 meters, um, 1.9 millimeters, you know, from one diff pair to the other going along this side and 1.7 going up and down that way. So it's a very dense interconnect. Another variation uh, application where you can use this is in uh, XPUs. Uh, if you, so if you don't need the full, you know, 512 lanes, you can, you, all you, with just only changing this kind of housing block here, you know, that the, 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 these modules go into, you can accommodate either, you know, something smaller that just lands on one edge, um, or you know you can even go to you know uh, wafer scaled XPUs where you accommodate a very large number of these uh, to get you know even higher throughput. Um, they don't have to be only four on each side as you see here. This is I think twelve on one side, nine on the other. So you can. It's all based on you know having these small modular blocks, each one of them like a localized sub interconnect, um, and you know, just, just arrange, arranging them, you know, on the substrate that you need. So that's, you know, the, 
kind of high level idea of this. Now I'm gonna go dive into signal integrity, simulation and measured data on this uh, interconnect. In, in doing that, I'm going to first just go over some of the elements that would, that would be in this link, in this CPC-based link. So I'll go over models of the CPC connector SI itself, uh, the OSFP connector that would mate to this, so it's what we call our chip to IO, and it's, so it's a cable-based, not an SMT-based uh, connector. Uh, and also another cable-based connector would be, you know, if it went to a backplane. So you could go from CPC to OSFP by way of cable or CPC to a cable backplane. Uh, I'll then also go through measured results of, of these connectors and including one where this is put together and shown at Microsoft's booth with MediaTek, uh, where we have several of these pieces running uh, with their CERTES. Uh, and then I'll talk about, you know, we're just starting work to also look at 448 gig, because while we're finishing work on the 224 gig CPC, we're also looking forward to how to extend this to 448. So here is a uh, simulation result shown for a small section of a CPC connector, um, you know, a four by four diff pair section of it. Uh, this is models. Uh, you know, so here, you know, showing the insertion, I'll, everything I'll show for in this case uh, being 224, I'll just show up to 67 gigahertz. Uh, but in models you see, okay, insertion loss is, you know, quite low, you know, generally up to Nyquist, less than the dB. Return loss is, you know, fairly good and very low crosstalks. You know, I know a lot of you guys are thinking, well, that, okay, crosstalks and sim, it's always nice, but I'll show some measurement data, data in a second as well that backs that up. So now for the measurements, uh, here's just a, a, a picture of the measurement setup we have here. So we're basically only going from a VNA to some RF test fixtures to some twin ax, because again, this is all twin ax based uh, interconnect uh, t technology, going to two Coolio connectors here. So we're going in on one, sorry, CPC connectors here uh, on this substrate board. So it's going in on the twin X here, going to the CPC connector, going through some substrate trace, then coming out of another CPC connector on the twin X, RF test fixture, and then back to the VNA. And then here's now measurement data on two of those uh, traces there. Um, so the insertion loss, and this is again, this is the whole channel. Uh, so it's not just you know, the substrate plus, sorry, the substrate plus the uh, CPC connector. It's also the, uh, the, the, the twin X as well. There's about a little bit less than 400, like 380 or so, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's 380 millimeters of twin X, both on the in, ingress and egress of that setup there. Um, so that, that's what it's, the bulk of this loss is from that twin X. Um, but also you can see here that the crosstalk, you know, is suggested by the, the simulation slide. The crosstalks are very low here. And that's, we expected that because again, this is twin X all the way up to that mating interface at the footprint. So you maintain that shielding all the way up there. And if I go back to a picture of that connector, sorry, you can see so the twin X has gone all the way up here and then we have like this, you know, kind of what we call wafers there that's maintaining a full 360 degree shield around each diff pair. So it's well isolated. And then having this kind of compressive elastomeric interface there between this, this surface and the matching uh, footprint on the substrate maintains this full 360 degree shield as these two are mated. So, so it preserves high isolation. One minute? Okay, sorry. It preserves high isolation in you know, these measurements as well. Basically this is the noise floor of the VNA essentially. Um, and also these, num these loss numbers here match up well with modeled tabulations of the losses of each of the individual components in that setup I have. Um, we have similar measurement data here for, uh, you know, our OSFP cable-based connector. So again, good performance out to out past Nyquist. Um, and I wanted to jump here to uh, a, a time-based. Uh, uh, this is what's shown in 
our joint demo with Microsoft and MediaTek. So it's this setup here, it's, it's, it's at Microsoft's booth, so I encourage you guys to go and take a look at it. But included here are the key elements of, of a link. There's gonna be two of these CPC connectors. Normally your CERTES or whatever, your switch would be right here and you would go through a CPC, uh, an o something like an OSFP connector, a DAC, another OSFP connector, and then over to a, a, another CPC connector back to your uh, 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 transceiver. Um, but here, because of the just pl plumbing limitations, we have some extra components, and also we have our CERTES or transceiver over this end. Um, but with this link here, so including two CPC connectors, two OSFP connectors, and a DAC, we're getting, they're getting 10 to the minus seven BER. Um, this is again over at Microsoft's booth, so I encourage you to look at it, and it's something we, we did with MediaTek CERTES there. Um, and just real quickly, we are already starting to look at work on 448, um, working on getting the bandwidth. In this case, we're considering, you know, out past, you know, let's say 75 gigahertz, for, or the not, not, not keeping a PAM4 solutions. We're push, we keep pushing the bandwidth as much as we can. But, you know, right now, you know, we're, I'd say out past 75 gigahertz, uh, but we still, we're working for more. But I think the solution, the technology, affords getting to a 448 gig solution, and we're working on that, and this is only the beginning steps, but uh, I think we can get there with that. Um, so I, I think I'll skip these slides. So just, uh, again, in terms of the summary, I've shown both model and measurement-based results, and I think this takes us out to at least 448 gig. All right, thank you very much. Mind. Thanks. <coughs> Ali, I'm sorry, we're two minutes behind the schedule, but um, I do have a clarification question. Yes. But before I ask the question, please, the next speakers, please come on stage. So we have next presentation from Amphenol talking about PCIe over optics. So while you coming to stage, it's Sam and Chris. Um, clarification, so we've seen flyover cables before used in switches, so in your uh, solution. What is the innovation? Is it higher density? Is it new connection? Is it lower loss? How is it different? I think we get higher density um, and also, you know, very high isolation, and uh, perhaps better isolation in terms of crosstalk. But to me, the innovation is using the elastomers, the interface here. So we can maintain uh, like a homogeneous structure, the twin axe, all the way up to the surface here. So there aren't impedance discontinuities due to changing structures and things like that. And it's, you know, full, again, a full 360 degrees uh, shielded isolation all the way through, um, including in the design of the elastomer here. That, you know, it's not just, the, you know, the footprint here and on this end, it's included in the elastomer. So it's a thin elastomer uh, that preserves that. And it's, since it's also thin, um, it's, you know, nearly invisible from an SI perspective. All right. The SI Thank impairments actually usually are dominated by the substrate. Thank you. We have to move on. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Let's go, yeah. No problem.